Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. Hey Jason, right now I train three days a week, full body style, and it's awesome, but my problem is due to that due to tight schedule in the close future, my workouts can last for 45 minutes to one hour max. Still, I can train four to five days a week with weights uh, properly for an hour max. I think about doing something like push, pull, push, pull, four day of week split, or a five days a week split like push, pull, push, pull, additional push, week one. Uh, I'll just skip all that part. Uh, what do you think about that? What do you recommend in such cases? Thank you and keep up the awesome work, coach. You know, the question I would ask you is why do you even need to run a split workout? Meaning you're limited to short gym time. Like, let's say you need to build as much muscle and strength as you can with a 45 minute workout. You don't have time to worry about splits. Come in and do big exercises. Now, you can rotate them around a bit. You can rotate them around a bit. But, but to honestly think that in a 45 minute workout, you're going to stimulate yourself enough to where you can't hit the same muscles or some of the same lifts the next day, it's just not reasonable. It's not reasonable. Split routines were developed so that people could train for a couple of hours straight on a certain type of movement pattern or body part, right? If, if you're not going to train for two hours straight, there's no point in splitting things up into push, pull, or any of that stuff for the most part. Um, again, I would say make, make most efficient use of your time and put your focus on big exercises. You could even run a modified type Bulgarian five days a week. You know, now you're probably going to want to do three lifts, and that's what it's going to come down to. You're going to want to do about three exercises every time you come in. If you can train five days a week, pick three big exercises, and do the workloads and reps and sets you plan on doing. I don't care whether it's a three by three, a five by five, a uh, Bulgarian style where you build to a training max, but you can put in 45 minutes, you can put a lot of effort into three big exercises exercises you know you can always do an accessory or something at the end but i think with 45 minutes to work with uh you don't have time to waste on accessory movements you really don't leave that to people who have unlimited training time hell i have unlimited training time you don't even see me doing many accessory stuff uh so that's ultimately what it comes down to and you, and you should probably do don't worry about splits Worry about focusing on the big lifts. Um, obviously, you're not going to come in and deadlift heavy five days every week, but you could do your squats or bench or overhead press. You could rotate stuff around. You know, you come in and squat one day, bench and chin up that same day, and then maybe the next day squat and deadlift and overhead press or weighted dips. You could do it that way. Uh, but think of it more in those terms. You have 45 minutes. There's no point in splitting your routine up with such a short workout. There's no, no reason to even consider doing so. All right, next question. Regarding spinal compression, what are some signs that an individual is overreaching with their axial loading? Uh, the same they are for everything else. They're, your body, as far as overreaching goes and overtraining goes, those are systematic responses. They are a systematic response to repeatedly subjecting yourself to more total adaptative stress than you can recover from. There, there's no difference in the signs. In other words, it doesn't matter whether it's excessive grip training that did it, whether it's excessive axial loading, excessive volume, the signs are the same. Uh, degradating performance, continual soreness, muscle cramping, lower back cramping, elevated resting heart rate, elevated blood pressure, right? Those are your signs. Uh, it doesn't matter which of the training stimulus contributed to what percentage of the systematic response, the systematic response to excessive stress chronically that you are not recovering from. So, so you're not going to be able to differentiate between that. There's going to be no measurable difference that you can tell whether it's your total training volume or your axial loading that's causing it. All right, next question. Why are athletes tested with a touch and go bench in NFL and NBA combines? Is it just a gauge of how strong these athletes have the potential to be if they're trained by the best strength and conditioning coaches? Uh, because it's a proxy for upper body strength. That's it. That's all it comes down to. And because the bench press uses over half of the muscles in the upper body. And because they have everyone do the exact same thing, they have a measure. You guys need to remember the reason we do rules in bench pressing as a sport is so that everyone is forced to do the exact same thing to see how much weight they can lift. In other words, if you have to pause on your chest, if you have to keep your foot in the same position, it's a better judge of strength. In their case, the guys are all touching and going. Well, if one guy can pause bench 
400 and another guy can pause bench 350. The guy who benches 400 pause can touch and go more than the guy who does 350. He's got stronger pecs, delts, triceps, stabilizers, everything else. Uh, the same thing on the number of reps. Strength is strength. That's what people forget. There is no such thing as high rep versus low rep strength. That's, that's absolute horseshit. A guy who benches 400 can do more reps with 225 than a guy who benches 315 can do with 225. Let that sink in. So if they're all allowed to touch and go and they're all allowed to cheat and they're just doing 225 to exhaustion, it's still going to give a good proxy from player to player as far as who has the best upper body strength. That's all it comes down to. It's just a standardized measurement of upper body strength. We could argue that it's not as great because they're allowed to touch and go and cheat and all that. But since they're all allowed to do the exact same form of cheating and they're all doing the exact same amount of weight, the strongest guy is going to get the least exhausted with a given number of reps. He's going to be able to do more reps than the weaker guy. It's very straightforward. Uh, it's still a good measurement in spite of, of all that because everyone's allowed to do the same stuff. All right, next question. How much worse are seated cable rows and T-bar rows compared to barbell rows for building the lats? You know, we could argue all day long about free weights versus cables for building a target muscle, but this is exactly the sort of stuff I tell people that holds people back and locks them into body building dogma when it comes to building muscle. They get caught up in this mindset of which exercise is best for targeting this muscle. They may not be. They might all be similar. So here's the point. If you have an exercise that is equal than two others for targeting a given muscle that you want to grow, but it builds more other muscles through the body, which one's better? The one that builds more muscles through the body. Uh, there's no real benefit to isolating one muscle in the body unless it is lagging behind everything else in your entire body and you don't want anything to grow but that muscle, right? Uh, how many of you guys out there though are happy with your bicep development and forearm development but you want more back? I can assure you very, very few of you are. How many of you out there think that you have as strong as possible of spinal erectors and abs, but just want your last to grow? Probably not very many. So when you look at it from that perspective, it doesn't matter which exercise targets an individual muscle more or less. As long as that muscle's a primary mover, a given amount of workload is still gonna cause the same growth, even if one is slightly better on the EMGs. Now that being said, the cable stuff doesn't oh, very rarely performs better on the EMGs, but let's just assume they were equal. Assuming they were equal, and they're usually not, the free weight exercises where you're standing incorporate more muscle through the entire body. Therefore, they're going to be better for overall hypertrophy. And back to my other point, none of you guys are happy with every single part of your body except for one muscle. Come on. So if you're not in that situation, which almost no one is, you shouldn't be thinking in those terms. You need to be thinking in terms of overall muscle mass, right? Overall muscle mass and maybe with an emphasis on doing more lifts that target your weaker body parts rather than saying what's well, going to target it specifically out of those lifts. It, it's not beneficial of you to think in those terms. It will hold you back it's paralysis by analysis and it will shortchange your overall size and strength. All right, next question and last question of the week. Hi coach, Price Plow made a video responding to your claims about the supplement industry. Any rebuttal video? You know what? Normally I wouldn't watch a channel that small, but I actually did watch that entire video. Uh, and that's very, very rare, guys. I'm going to be honest with you. 99% of the videos out there that criticize me, I haven't watched. I don't actually watch them. So when people say, hey, how do you respond to what these people are saying? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't listened. Uh, I actually paid attention to this one because it, some people told me it was worth watching. I watched the entire video. Um, I can appreciate the fact that the guy at least wanted to focus upon not all the nonsense and the BS, but just what I was saying. He said that like with everything else, you got to take what a person says point by point. You don't look at them collectively always as a person. Uh, I can respect that fact because I I'm, I'm often do that. I will oftentimes say when someone I can't stand, who I think is a total con man and, uh, and everything else, when they get a point right, I'll give them credit for getting a point right. That's only being fair and objective. It could be someone whose guts I absolutely hate. I'll still give them credit when they get something right, right? That, that's, you have to be fair like that. The um, thing I, I, I was kind of uh, amused at, though, was this point of saying, look, not everyone in the supplement industry is a bad person. 
but the industry itself is built upon lies and BS and fake products. So the problem is that everyone in the supplement industry is still directly involved in selling products that are garbage. The majority of the products do not work. The majority of them are garbage and a complete waste of money. So if your company sells 30 products and two of them actually work or three of them actually work, you're still pimping snake oil. That doesn't make you a good person, it makes you a con man. Um, that's just my perspective on it. And the other thing that I thought was amusing is that, you know, he said all these supplements work, but the thing is, a lot of them, your diet would still sort that out. For example, you know, in the Western world, we all drink coffee or tea. Uh, yes, caffeine has ergogenic benefits. It's a, it, it has benefits, right? But if we're all drinking coffee or tea in the morning or before we train, which is pretty common, why would we need to supplement caffeine? It's just silly. Um, you get that from your diet and there are other health benefits to coffee besides the caffeine in it there are other benefits to these things so it's just like again short changing the benefits of eating certain foods and things uh, trying to get an ergogenic aid when you could have just got it from the food to begin with without supporting a con man industry and the other thing though is that he admitted even though a lot of these things work there is no supplement in the world that is ever going to take you to the next level Right? There is no supplement or combination of supplements in the world that has the physical capability of taking you to the next level. Which brings me back to my point. Supplements cost more than anabolic steroids do. All right, Let that sink in. No product that any supplement company makes, and this is admitted by a guy kind of somewhat involved in the industry there, actually can take you to the next level. So why in the hell should you be paying $50 a bottle for it? It doesn't make any sense. That That's a ripoff. If it only boosts your potential performance, every supplement in the world, the best ones combined together, only give you a possible half a percent or a quarter of a percent advantage, and you're dishing out $100 a month for that, you're taking it up the backside with no reach around and no loop. That's exactly what it is. That's a con. So it's like I don't think he realized it. From my perspective, I see that as a ripoff. They're charging that much money for it be a lot of people are out there on a budget, charging more than their gym membership for products of which none of which are going to take them to the next level. And the majority of the ones that do work could just be gleaned by eating a better diet. It's that simple. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.